regular meeting of November the 1st. This is our first meeting for November. We will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll follow that with an invocation by Alderman Sistrunk and a moment of silence. We will join you in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Alderman Sistrunk, if you would please. Loving God, we lift our hearts to you in prayer as we begin this meeting. May we have the wisdom to know what's ours to do and what action to take. May we remain open to your guidance and may we draw upon your wisdom. Amen. All right. Thank you again, everyone. We appreciate everyone being here this evening. Um, First thing for us to do would be approval of the official agenda with consented items. I have one item that I emailed the board about adding at the table. Ms. Harden has taken the uh, opportunity to put it on the agenda that is in front of you. It is under um, fire department number two, which is a permission to apply for a grant. I would suggest if uh, there is no objection that we might put that on a consent agenda, but I will wait till we go through. Um, and as far as I know, there, are, there is nothing else um, for us to do other than to go um, with the consented items in the official agenda. Alderman Carver, do you have any changes? Well, what I was going to ask a question, we, we, can, we can pull it from the uh, consent agenda, is on the garbage services with the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, just reading headlines, making sure that we, uh, uh, was not the Friday, we have, or do they have the capacity with everything, they're having issues with the trucks to, to handle this agreement? Well, it's us handling the agreement. And this is for us. Okay. Yes, this is for us being good neighbors to try to help the county in their time of distress, shall we say, for not picking up the garbage. We're not going to put ourselves uh, in jeopardy. We've put this down as a two-month agreement that we then revisit. Um, I'm not sure if the county is interested, but I know they've contacted uh, the vice mayor, and I've talked to them briefly about it, but I thought it would be an opportunity for us to um, show some goodwill and help them if they indeed wanted to. So we put together some numbers where we could uh, charge them and, and it was us in the county. It has nothing to do with their service provider, who is Golden Triangle. So this is just our opportunity to see if we can help. And we'll still be able to provide all the service to our. Oh citizens. yes, we're not going. We're not about to cut okay. the city of Starkville short. Thank you. I, I, uh, no additions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Rupp. No mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Brooks. Uh, no mayor. Thank you. Alderman Beatty. No mayor. Thank you, Alderman Sisco. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Perkins. No mayor. Mayor. Thank you. Alderman Vaughn? No, ma'am, ma'am, thank you. So I couldn't entice anybody to put that on the consent agenda oh, for me. Uh, <laughs> allow me, please. Move approval. Okay. Can we put the Move approval, ma'am. <laughs> All right, so um, I, have a, I have an idea that someone uh, wanting to put that item on the agenda, and seeing no objections, then we will place the, the fire department item number two on the consent agenda. So thank you very much. All right. <laughs> having, having said that, um, if I could get a motion to approve the official agenda with the consented items as amended. So moved. On a motion from Alderman Rupp, do I have a second? Second. Second from Alderman Brooks. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And I will now read the consented items. First is consideration of the minutes of the October 4th, 2022 regular meeting of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville. Consideration of the minutes of the October 14th, 2022 work session of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville. Under Mayor's business, we have consideration of the first amended agreement between the City of Starkville and the Octobahaw County Humane Society, Inc., for the management and operation of the City of Starkville Animal Shelter. Two is consideration of the long-term lease of two plus or minus acres for the expansion of the humane shelter facilities and operations. Three is consideration of the interlocal agreement with Octobahaw County to provide residential trash garbage services on an as-needed and mutually agreed-upon basis with a re-evaluation of the city costs at the end of a two-month period. Under board business, item two is consideration of a resolution of the mayor and board of aldermen of the city of Starkville, Mississippi, authorizing the issuance of general obligation public improvement bonds of the, mun of the municipality or a general obligation public improvement bond of the municipality for sale to the, municip to the Mississippi Development Bank or authorizing entering into a loan agreement with and obtaining a loan from the Mississippi Development Bank, all in the maximum aggregate principal amount of $15 million, in one or more federally taxable or tax-exempt series, and for a term of any individual series not to exceed 30 years to provide funds for the authorized purposes and for related purposes. Under Department Business Airport, we have request approval of change order number one from Tabor Construction and Development of Mississippi for grading excess dirt in the amount of $4,838.40 
from the 2022 DMOT MM-0068-1022 grant at George M. Bryan Field. Two is request approval of awarding a contract A to the low bidder erect a tube in the amount of $228,712 to manufacture and deliver a corporation hanger, including the door at George M. Bryan Field, funded from the 2022 MDOT multimodal grant MM-0006081022. The FAA AIG grant and up to 2.5% match from the airport. <clears throat> um, under engineering, item one, consideration of an engineering services contract with Neil Schaefer for the build grant project, construction engineering and inspection CENI, and authorize the mayor to execute any necessary MDOT paperwork for this project in accordance with the MDOT local public agency's LPA manual pending MDOT approval. Two is consideration of approving summary change order number one for the 2022 street improvement project in the amount of $352,128.33 to include necessary asphalt and striping improvements for roads including West Garrett, University, and South Montgomery. Three is request authorization to advertise for bids for the Cornerstone Boulevard, Boulevard entrance landscaping project. Four is request authorization to advertise for bids for the Cornerstone Boulevard pavement overlay project from Highway 25 to new <coughs> Cornerstone Park entrance. Five is request, I'm sorry, consideration of approval of change order number three in the amount of $65,439.92 for the Sportsplex drainage for adjustments to final quantities, electrical repairs, and drainage box adjustment. Under fire department, we have request permission to allow Preston Newman and Ryan Klassen to travel to Savannah, Tennessee for the 14th annual Tennessee River Training Weekend, November 4th through 6th, 2022, at an approximate cost of $1,100, travel meals, registration, and hotel. And then on consent, number two is request permission to apply for a grant recently offered by the Mississippi Bureau of Emergency Management Services for the purchase of AEDS medical supplies or other allowable medical equipment in the amount of $14,855 with a city match of $3,698.55. Under HR, we have number one, request authorization to hire Nicholas Evans, Hayden Pierce, Shane Russell, and Kamal Williams as entry-level firefighters and Colton Birmingham as a certified firefighter in the Startwell Fire Department. Under Parks, we have request authorization to reject the bids received October 13, 2022 and re-advertise for three concession stand trailers for Cornerstone Park. Under the Police Department, we have request approval to apply and accept if awarded a Walmart community grant in the amount of $2,000 to be used in the area of public safety technology advancement. B is request permission to purchase one stationary automated license plate reader through the 100% reimbursable Homeland Security subgrant. The preferred of the two quotes being Vigilant Motorola Solutions L6Q, the cost of the system being $9,615. C is request permission to accept the Enterprise Service Agreement for Vigilant Solutions automated license plate reader for the hotspot grant purchase of a vehicle automated license plate reader previously approved by the board. Under code enforcement, we have consideration of calling for a public hearing under Mississippi Code Annotated 21-1911 to determine whether the structure located at 514 West Main Street with parcel number 1180, I'm sorry, 80-00-233.00 is a menace to the public health, safety, and welfare of the community. B is consideration of calling for the public hearing under Mississippi Code Annotated 21-1911 to determine whether the structure located at 104 Windsor Road with parcel number 118H-00-113.00 is a menace to the public health, safety, and welfare of the community. And C is consideration calling for a public hearing under Mississippi Code Annotated 21 to determine whether the structure located at 107 East Gillespie Street with parcel number 102A-00-087.00 is a menace to the public health, safety, and welfare of the community. Under utilities, we have request authorization to advertise for bids for the downtown water and sewer replacement project. Two is accept the emergency authorization consistent with presidential determination number 2022-19 from TransArmor to rebuild 20 transformers at a cost of $26,557. Three is request authorization to accept the lowest quote from Wren Body Works LLC for a utility bid for a Ford F-250 in the amount of $10,547. Number four is request authorization to accept the lowest and best quote from Wren Body Works, LLC, for a utility bid for a Ford F-350 in the amount of $10,547.
Number five is request authorization to advertise for source of supply bids for the electric and water divisions of Starkville Utilities mm -hmm. with the intent of awarding the source of supply contracts for January 1, 2023 through June 30, 2022, as well as July 1, 2023 through December 31, 2023. Number six is request authorization to declare excess culverts, bridge components, and other materials not on inventory as surplus and to auction, gov deal, auction on gov deals. Number seven is request authorization to renew asset essentials software license agreement from Brightly Solutions. Number eight is request authorization to purchase F-350 chassis 60-inch cab to axle for replacement of vehicle 128 in the amount of $40,401 and request authorization to accept the lowest and best quote from Rand Body Works LLC for the bed assembly and installation for the service truck for wastewater in the amount of $29,782.11. And last but not least, number nine, request authorization to accept, accept the best quote from Michael Box for College View pump station removal in the amount of $39,647.68. And that concludes the consent agenda items. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir, it is my pleasure. All right, um, with that said, the next item we have is mayor's comments, and I get the pleasure of introducing new employees, which is always always fun and always pleasant for all of us up here to put faces to names. So um, we will start with the Starkville Fire Department. We have Mr. Zalen Brown, and there's the chief and Mr. Brown, okay? Zalen was born in Jackson, Mississippi, but grew up in Clinton. Zalen was raised by two great parents, Dr. Kristen Brown and Renardo Bradford. He attended Clinton and Macomb High Schools, graduating in 2020. Zalen was an active member of the Clinton Band from middle school, middle school through high school. Some of Zalen's hobbies include exercising, cooking, and being outdoors. Welcome, Zalen. Happy to have you. Next, we have David Devon Dosher. David was born in Ackerman, Mississippi. He is the oldest child of David and Dolores Dosher and has a younger sister, Kelly Dosher. I am pronouncing that correctly, right, Dosher? Yes, ma'am. Good, thank you. David graduated from East Mississippi Community College after receiving his degree. He later enrolled in Mississippi State University. Prior to joining the fire department, David worked multiple jobs, including car salesman, maintenance, janitorial service, and installing security and fire alarm systems. His hobbies are reading, fishing, and exercising. Welcome. And next we have Will Fenimore. Ah, coming up from the back. <laughs> we didn't do you in the, in the order. Mr. Fenimore was born and raised in Aurora, Colorado. He has a kind of knack for tinkering and working with his hands, which is why he chose mechanical engineering for a major and enrolling at Mississippi State University, as his grandfather was a professor there and his mother and uncle also attended. At age eight, he was involved in a dirt bike accident and received a third degree burn. He attended the Children, Children's Hospital burn camps program after being burned and was given the position of burn ambassador, which allowed him to travel around the state and even to Manchester, UK to raise money. Will credits his experience with the camp as the reason he wanted to join the fire service. He loves being outside with his family, riding dirt bikes, hunting, and fishing. So welcome, Will. <laughs> and next we have, oh, I'm on the front page here, uh, Gene King, firefighter. All right, again from the back this morning. All right. Actually, everybody's a firefighter tonight. We don't have anybody else. This is awesome. All right, Gene was born and raised in West Point, Mississippi. He graduated high school in 2011 and later joined the U.S. Army, thank you for your service, where he served three and a half years as an infantryman and later becoming a tank mechanic. He attended Northeast Mississippi Community College and received his associate's degree in criminal justice. Gene also attended the University of Southern Mississippi where he studied forensic science and studied criminology at Mississippi State. He has three children, two girls and one son. In his spare time, Gene enjoys riding dirt bikes, four-wheeler horses, and playing basketball. Welcome. Then we have Jackson County. Is that right, Jackson? Did I pronounce that correctly? All right. Jackson attended Starkville Public Schools and after moving to Starkville in the second grade from Houston, Texas. Jackson enjoys training his dog and enjoys playing soccer with friends as well as listening to audio books almost every day. Welcome, Jackson. <laughs> Kyan Robinson. Did I get that one right? Mm -hmm. A long iron. Okay, great. Thank you. Kyan was born in West Point, Mississippi, and is a graduate of West Point High School. He attended EMCC and worked as a welder at Plum Creek before joining the Starkville Fire Department. He's the son of Felicia Henley and Fred Robinson, and he has two siblings, Trey Robinson and Tamara Robinson. Kyan is a proud father to a baby girl named Harriet Robinson. In his free time, Kyan enjoys taking care of his baby girl and spending time with his family. He's a member of the Northside Christian Church in West Point, Mississippi. Welcome. Jacob Vargo. J 
Jacob was born in Memphis, Tennessee and attended the Evangelical Christian School. He is the son of Jake and Christy Vargo, and he has three siblings, John, Gracie, and Kate. Jacob is currently a sophomore at Mississippi State studying criminology. He grew up hunting, fishing, and working on his grandfather's property. He attends church at Grace Presbyterian in Charlotte. While at Mississippi State, he joined the East Octavia Hall Fire Department and developed a strong appreciation for the fire service. When the opportunity to work for the Charlotte Fire Department presented itself, along with continuing his education at Mississippi State, he knew it was something he wanted to pursue. Jacob spends a lot of his free time training his new pup, a black lab named Daisy. Welcome, Jacob. Thank, thank you all. We appreciate you joining our service. And this, the last young man is a member of that new group that you were? Yes, ma'am. Yes, from the uh, university? Yes, the program? We have two, actually. Two, I'm sorry. Fenimore oh, okay, great. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Glad to have all of you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. So hopefully everyone had a great Halloween and enjoyed the, all the candy that went with that. Um, we've got a weekend coming up for football, so we're back at being busy this weekend and looking forward to perhaps some good weather for all of us and, and a successful successful game. So that's all I have. All of them comments. Uh, Alderman Carver, anything from you, sir? Oh, no, ma'am. I may refer back to you with just comment on the mural that was just finished up. I just happened to come by in passing today and look Beautiful, at it. Beautiful, isn't it? It is. It's, it's a great mural. Um, good addition to the city. Okay. Good. Good. Alderman Ruff. No, ma'am. Alderman Brooks. No, ma'am. Alderman Beatty. No, ma'am. I want to remind everybody that Tuesday we have general elections here in the city of Starkville and in Octibaha County. And so please get a sample ballot because you'll be surprised when you get there and go, I didn't know we were voting on that. So uh, get your sample ballot, get educated, and go vote Tuesday. If you are not going to be in town, if you are 65 or older, if your work prohibits you from being able to vote next Tuesday, you have until Saturday at noon to vote with an absentee ballot. And thank you for voting. Thank you. Vice Mayor? No, thank you, Mayor. All right. Alderman Vaughn. Sorry, High Game will be played Thursday night due to the shortage of referee, so we'll be playing Thursday night, and Thursday night is senior night. Okay, wonderful. And, and that's the second time they've done that with the shortage of referees. Uh, yeah, they, we might need to take up a, a second role <laughs> and go be a, a referee. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. And just to, just to tag back to the mural, uh, Alderman Carver, that was done, uh, uh, Attorney Julie Brown, commissioned that, and that was Deborah Mansfield, who is uh, a West Point artist who is doing that. She's done several around town, so she really has done a, a, an incredible job on that. All right, next we have citizens' comments. Anyone who wishes to uh, comment and make some, uh, bring something to the attention of the board, you have three minutes. All of this is timed by Ms. Harden, who is our city clerk sitting over here. Um, we do not normally answer in return, but we, but we listen intently. So, Mr. Turner. Um, I was agreeing to Mayor and the board, my name is Adam Turner Ward 7. Um, to, to the mayor, to the police chief, to the fire chief. Um, citizens have a few things that is getting to be eerie all around, and that is uh, people taking the Second Amendment to do as they please, and when they uh, do this stuff, then they are uh, coming with a mental problem. But uh, uh, to everyone, uh, uh, we, we seen what happened to the Speaker of the House husband. And so that we don't have to be careful because long as uh, people can do whatever they want to and blame it on it, mental illness and get away with it, they will. Uh, but now the, uh, uh, the people that is in the military and they are trained to protect themselves. Uh, but to the uh, uh, citizens, let's, let's be careful. Time, time will change. This, this weekend, it will be dark early. So let's, we just going to have to be careful and be watching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Anyone else wishing to speak under citizens' comments? Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I'll close it for citizens' comments. We next have public appearances. We have two public appearances. One is Students for a Sustainable Campus. Ms. Uh, Emma Van Epps, are you here? Yes, ma'am. If you would come up, please. Um, you have 10 minutes, again, timed by Ms. Harden. 
and I think you have a presentation as I understand it? Yes, ma'am. All right. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Emma Van Epps. Um, I'm the current president of Miss, uh, Mississippi State's club, Students for Sustainable Campus. And so I wanted to inform the Board of Aldermen about our 2022 Climate March. Um, so is there a clicker? There we go. Beautiful. Um, so a quick overview of the event. This is our fourth annual Climate March, and it was held on October 22nd. Um, it was organized by our club, Students for Sustainable Campus, um, where we marched from the drill fields to City Hall, uh, as well as hearing educational speeches along the way, uh, to march for a more sustainable Starkville and MSU community. Uh, and so the purpose of this event is to increase community awareness about the climate crisis, and to also submit demands for more sustainable changes to the university and the city. Um, so I'd like to go through um, our specifically City of Starkville demands, because um, we also have some to the university. Um, but the first of which being re to reinstate curbside recycling, because we were aware that we used to be, the City of Starkville used to offer these services, and after COVID-19 that was not, no longer continued. Um, and we are aware that the Think Green Center is a resource and is a great resource that we're very grateful for. Um, but one obstacle um, for people recycling is that it's primarily open during um, the workday except for the 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the first Saturday of each month. And that can be a big obstacle for people that are either um, in their jobs during those hours or are maybe disabled and have a hard time um, hauling their, their recyclables to the Think Green Center. Um, and so we think that re reinstating curbside recycling would be a great way to overcome this obstacle. Um, we are also the only SEC town uh, without curbside recycling according to all of their municipal websites. And so I think to keep ourselves competitive also with the um, other SEC communities, especially as we are becoming so much more of a um, sports tourism city. I think that would be um, very good in terms of advertising our city to potential tourists. Um, we also propose, so our proposal is that Starkville introduce an opt-in curbside recycling program using the 100 plus recycling bins that it already has. Um, and so we chose an opt-in program uh, for two reasons. One, because we, already, we only have so many recycling bins um, that I've been informed about. Um, and also to reduce the rates of contamination and also to um, kind of conserve costs if this program were to start and then continue to be developed. Um, because there is always the question of contamination rates. That's always a big obstacle for recycling programs. And so we think that partnering with Keep Starkville Beautiful with their educational uh, media campaigns about what can and cannot be recycled in Starkville, like for example, plastics, um, and also having this program be an opt-in program would decrease starting costs and also kind of s naturally select for people that are already not going to be contaminating the recycling. Um, if you did all of the steps to opt into this program, um, those, that population would, in theory, be a lot less likely to recycle poorly. Um, and so I'm also aware that this is a m agenda item later in the meeting, and so um, I do want to acknowledge that and I'm very excited to hear about that. And definitely make sure to open, I'd like to open it up to questions as soon as I finish the uh, presentation. And so our next demand of the city is to create a sustainable business awards program. And so this is an idea that we had um, because we really wanted to prioritize working with the city of Starkville um, in ways that like help everybody. And so one idea that we had is for the city of Starkville and the partnership to together offer an award well, an awards program for businesses based on their sustainable business practices. And so some example categories could be most sustainable restaurant, retailer, um, a lot, we'd have a bunch of different uh, categories that businesses could submit their um, nominations for. And so they would be judged based off of, based off of the uniqueness of the achievement, um, the level of effort that was required, commitment to sustaining the achievement, because that's huge, um, and also just the significance and the impact that it would have on the community. Um, and this set of parameters is also modeled after uh, similar awards and other um, SEC locations, like mainly like Gainesville, Florida has a similar program. Um, and we think that this would be very helpful to A, promote local businesses, but also promote sustainable business practices that could help them in the future continue to be uh, just as successful and keep up with the changing states of the economy and how that relates to environmentalism. Um, and so our organization, Students for a Sustainable Campus, is very willing to create all the parameters, the nomination form. We'll, we'll be willing to read all the nominations and choose it if that is what's easiest for the committee. Um, but the reason that we don't create this ourselves and have it be the Students for a Sustainable Campus Sustainable Business Awards is because that comes with a credibility issue. Um, we think that businesses and leaders would be much less likely to take a team of students seriously compared to uh, the city of Starkville and the partnership. Um, and so I'll be honest, we're willing to do all of the work, but we need a, 
a City of Starkville email address, or at least sponsorship, um, from the City of Starkville to say that this is something that we're putting on um, and that we endorse. We're, we're willing to make all of the forms and uh, sort through all of the nominations if that's what is um, most convenient for this being able to be put into effect. Um, and some incentives we thought of would be, um, of course, advertising um, the program, but we would like to explore if potential tax rebates would be an option for a type of program like this, or at least be incorporated after so many years if that is, um, if the program is successful enough. Um, so I'd love to explore that opportunity if that's possible. Um, and then finally, our third demand is about addressing the issue of building code enforcement, because I know that this is something that is not new and that the city has been experiencing for a long time, because that's not a problem that really arises overnight. Um, and so we worked very closely with um, the uh, organization Starkville Strong about their reports and their experiences with this issue, especially with their work um, with people experiencing homelessness. Um, and so one of the big issues that we've um, been informed about is uh, that tenants who submit re reports of code enforcement issues have, are having to repeatedly get in contact with um, code enforcement officers or fill out forms and have to follow up on a really, really, like, regular basis um, in order to have any of these changes be enacted. Um, and so we see that as a communication barrier happening between the tenants, the landlords, and uh, the office. And so we don't believe that that burden should be on the tenants. And so some ideas we have on how to kind of alleviate this issue um, is to propose the city of Starkville prioritize um, hiring a new community development director as well as um, based off reports and conversations with um, Starkville Strong and various members of the community that about four knowledgeable code enforcement officers would be appropriate to address this ongoing issue because we don't believe that it is an issue of code enforcement officers doing a bad job but with the magnitude of the problem the magnitude of the problem we're facing um, requires more action because this is something that we actually spoke about at our last uh, climate march event and still have not seen a lot of meaningful significant changes being made and we have been we are aware that the um, list of like code violations has been updated and a new officer I think there's a total of three if I'm correct um, are currently employed now which is great progress um, but we want to prioritize um, transparency in the process of um, code enforcement and making reports and also like taking accountability for some ongoing cases of neglect um, and so a lot of complaints are end up including uh, black mold, major water leaks, gaps in windows and doors, um, floors and ceilings that are like sinking in, um, among others. And so that's something we'd really like to work together. Thank you very much with the um, board about um, solving because we want to be a resource for you. And so I'd like to go ahead and sum up our presentation with the support for our demands. So I have a picture of some of the people that marched at our March this year, we had about 50 people marching with us, as well as an online petition with over 200 signatures from members of the community. I believe the number right now is about 214. Um, and so I'd like to definitely invite you to ask me any questions and kind of have a discourse about how some of these changes could be enacted. Okay. Normally we don't do that, but we'll oh, poll, sure. the bowl and see if, poll the board and see if anyone wishes to have poll yes. the rub. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> action item number two, sure. I think would be a great fit for the Main Street Association, and I'm on that board, and I'm also at Mississippi State, so any of you have classes in McCool? Yes, sir. Right, I'm in the E Center. You know where the E Center is? Yes, sir. Uh, I would love to get you connected with Main Street, because I think they have the resources and the credibility to implement that program, so could you stop by and let's talk about it? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Any questions? Yes, I want to make a statement on this. Uh, on the baby. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ben Epps, thank you. And thank you for bringing in all of you. Thank you for coming tonight and making us aware of, um, of a very, very important things that we need to, to do and, and be looking at the city of Starland. Um, you did say all the other SEC school, college towns, host cities, the Southeastern Conference. Schools have curbside recycling acceptance for According to the current municipal websites, yes. I do know that, um, and I, I, I will correct something you said, that, that just because I'm on the board, that um, we didn't discontinue curbside recycling during the pandemic. We had already, when I came on board, and all of the years ago, we had discontinued all recycling. 
We yeah. probably recycle them back and have our collection site at the sanitation department. But there was not on the curbside, but all recycling had been curtailed in the city of Starkville three years ago. Um, in regards to Oxford, our neighbor, um, Oxford had curbside recycling, discontinued it during the pandemic, went to a uh, collection only, to two, collect mm -hmm. two collection sites, um, thought that they would, that their tonnage would drop off, it dropped off very little. And the mayor uh, in, in Oxford, in a statement, I, I found an article in the, in the Oxford paper, uh, they reinstated really their curbside recycling last October because the demand was there and went back to it. And, and of course, they charge a mandatory fee. Um, I guess the second thing I want to say, and, and it's going to segue into the, in the part I'm not going to, uh, I just had uh, re curbside recycling put on the agenda. Um, okay. And uh, I'm, get, I'm getting some figures together so I can address the board about the cost and the p a potential program for that. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, I mean, I've got a five-year-old grandson. Um, you probably met Walter. Um, and um, we, the city of Starkville, is Mississippi's college town. That's what our slogan is. We spent millions of dollars on recreation, on street projects. We just had Bulldog Bash. That wasn't C paid for. That was MSU, Student Association paid for. But that was a $200,000 event. I'm just putting in context what we put, what we prioritize and put money on, and we do not have a curbside recycling program. I think that's something that's missing in deficit of the city of Starr. Um, um, I'm glad that all of you came tonight. Thank, thank you for coming and, 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 and I guess, um, increasing awareness of something that, uh, of, of that, this and those other, and your other issues that we need to be about uh, making changes on. And, uh, we appreciate you coming tonight. All of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, and as long as they're here and they showed up, let's introduce your your fellow um, committee members or yes, please. association some members. Some members of our um, exec committee, um, okay. officer heads. Okay. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Um, Hi, I'm Courtney Cochran, and I'm vice president. Okay. I am Grant Peterson. I'm I'm the excuse me campaign director. Uh, so I like organize the climate march and I'll organize the Earth Day Fair in the spring. Okay, thank you. I am Rebecca Carruth and I am our service coordinator, so any service projects that we do throughout the year, I'm in charge of. Okay, thank you very much. It would be a shame for you to be here and then not be recognized. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, please. All right, if thank not, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. All right, our next item uh, is the South Montgomery Traffic Study. Um, Pastor Dennis Laughlin, I believe you I must have really had trouble with preachers before. Everybody I've talked to was nervous that I was coming to raise cane or something. So uh, definitely not doing that. Um, I do want to uh, give honor to our leadership. Thank you for this opportunity. To our mayor, Board of Aldermen, thank you for being here. I do want to say thank you to the mayor. She called me last week as uh, talking about this. And, uh, of course, Alderman Vaughn, we pray together at our schools every Wednesday morning and got to talk to him, got his advice. Uh, Alderman Carver took my phone call. Also, Alderman uh, Rupp, uh, I thought he was. I looked at an old map, found out that Alderman Brooks is actually my alderman now. So I do appreciate uh, the response for everyone taking time and uh, very quickly getting back with me and uh, certainly not ignored. And I know being in, I guess, the public service industry, a lot of times you don't get a lot of thank yous for that most of the time it's coming and beating on this podium and you know even throwing a chair as alderman rupp said if you want to throw a chair or something but you know so thank you for for getting back with me i'm here today to express my concerns about the traffic issue on south montgomery and possible solutions to it that might negatively affect our church and uh to give you my future concerns i just want to give you a little bit of history if you don't know our church, the Starkville Church of God, uh, has been in existence for over 100 years. We celebrated in April our 100-year anniversary. The church began in a schoolhouse that was owned by the cotton mill. Uh, it then moved uh, a couple different places, eventually built 
um, the blonde brick structure that is now an apartment complex on Maxwell Street and uh, was there for several years. And then in 1976, the Lord strategically located us where we are now uh, at Loxley in South Montgomery. Uh, our five acres was purchased for $20,000 uh, before Loxley Way was built or the surrounding neighborhoods were present. Uh, the sanctuary that we have was built for $73,000 and a lot of lo volunteer labor. The parsonage was built for $45,000 and a lot of volunteer labor. So after around a year of completion and spending $138,000, an offer was made for $1 million back in the 70s still. Uh, the offer was rejected because the church felt like that we were where we were supposed to be. Over the years, there's been several other offers that have come in, some that were seriously considered, uh, but the church has remained at our current location. And in January of 2003, plans were drawn up for a new sanctuary that I brought with me here uh, that would sit in front of our current sanctuary. And I do believe that we are positioned strategically on that hill uh, in Starkville, Mississippi for a reason. I have a vision, and I know that this is a Board of Aldermen meeting, but I am a pastor, and even as Board of Aldermen, I know that your mayor casts vision, and I just want to share with you my vision as a leader in this community. I believe we'll continue to fill our sanctuary. Our church went through a few years of downtime since these 2003 plans were drawn up. However, we're seeing more and more come in, and I believe we'll fill our sanctuary once and I believe we'll do it twice on a Sunday morning and then move on uh, to these plans. I believe deep spiritual wells have been dug uh, for over 100 years as a congregation and over 45 at our current location uh, to help us reap this last day harvest in Starkville, Octibaha County, Mississippi State University, and the Golden Triangle area. Uh, if you're not aware, our Compassion Pantry uh, has been going on since 2000, 2001. And uh, we help feed hundreds uh, every month that come in to our location where we are. Just last night, we hosted a trunk or treat where hundreds of Starkville residents came. They were given a safe, friendly place to enjoy the night with their family. I also want to take the time to say thank you to Starkville PD and the chief for allowing uh, some officers to come over there. And uh, they gave out candy, great community relations. So thank you so much for that. Um, I say all this to say we don't want to sell out and move out of town. Uh, I believe we've been blessed with a strategic location and we intend to remain right where we are. Now I've been pastor there since February of 2021, but I am originally born and raised in Houston, Mississippi, even when they still, I was some of the last, I think, babies born in the Houston hospital. I graduated at Houston Hilltopper in 1998, and so I'm thankful to be home. This is home for me. Uh, I tell you all that to say that if the Lord will allow me, I've learned to say never, say never, never say what I'm going to do. If the Lord will allow me, I intend to retire right here. So here's my concern that if the South Montgomery Loxley Way intersection were converted to a traffic circle or another lane were to be added, it would most likely take away from us some needed room to expand as we would like to uh, in the near future. Some time back before I was here, I was told, again, this is what I've been told, and I know there's power lines, that there are the high-voltage TVA power lines that cut right across our property and that the church had no input in that. Now, I'm not here to gripe about that, but because of this, uh, it will no doubt be a costly obstacle because of the fact that anything built has to be so many feet away from those lines, and I know that there would have to be a corner pole extended there, so you know, I might be back one day to ask y'all for a little help with that you never know uh, but because of that I just wanted to be certain and I've been as I've talked to as I said several aldermen and the mayor herself also I did want to bring into record uh, as the mayor suggested I don't know who I need to give this to I brought one official signed copy and I don't know serving on different boards like I do I've got one that can be given to everybody if you like that just stating our official request that we would really, really, really like it if uh, you know we were able to keep what we have because we do plan to expand and we want to be a part of the community. We don't want to sell out and go out on 25 or anywhere else or buy a big place. I believe God's got us where we are in the community, close to campus, close to everything. And uh, 
That's all I've got to say. This is uh, this is those plans just so you can visualize it. Uh, this is Loxley, South Montgomery. This is our current sanctuary, current family life center, the current parcel sits there. It'll be a building right there, nursery office space. So you see you get closer there, and I know parking is also required for a building that size, and I believe that we have space for it now, but if we were to ever lose any of that, it would be. Again, I know that we're talking downstream, South Montgomery, I've been told, but I also just wanted to put that in, let y'all know, um, let you know I didn't come up here to race cane, make any trouble. So I appreciate you. Thank you, I can take welcome. any questions or anything that you that you got for me. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Not seeing any, so uh, we can hold them, baby. Yeah. How soon would you consider this? It's. Uh, that's all. I really don't have a number right now. I mean, we're looking probably five years, you know, off or more. Um, again, I wanted to get a, a jump on it just just because I know if y'all start heading in a direction and start investing money into a specific direction in this project, I could come and ask and y'all have to say you've put too much into it and everything. I would suggest that you, if you think it's going to be a five-year you know, five project, mm -hmm. Develop some plans to show. I know those. those if that's going to be your plan, have something sure. developed where you, we could our planning department look at it and see. Okay. You know, you're going to have parking spaces for the side building. Sure. You know. Okay. So we can get that through. You know, get that out of the way. Sure. Um, so, that, you know, I don't know. It might. If we put a traffic circle over there, could you still accommodate your, your parking with? The, a new building. That's that's the, that's, the best, a, that's your question. that's a that's mid, yes that's six four questions. So. Yes, <laughs> uh, but that I'd go ahead and, and let our plane department start working with you on this as, as soon as you think y'all are starting that process to move. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next time on the agenda is a public hearing. Mr. Haviland, it's a request for a variance from stormwater requirements. I believe the applicant is in the room. This is VA 22-13. It is a request by Boardtown Enterprises LLC from a stormwater requirement, a variance from stormwater requirements located at 216 Industrial Park Road. This is located right on the northwest corner of the intersection of Lynn Lane and Industrial Park Road. The applicant is looking to renovate the existing building, which I believe is already underway, um, to put in Humble Coffee's uh, brewing facility. Now, uh, as a previous request, they'd also have sort of like a cafe open to the public kind of thing. The proposed uh, project does increase the size of the gravel parking, as kind of shown up here, but at this phase, does not increase the size of the building. Um, the existing lot is heavily wooded. Um, you can see from these views along Lynn Lane and then looking toward the western property line. Um, these trees would have to be removed as part of this. You can see the area in green, that would be the trees that are retained. The area in the pink would be trees that would have to be removed as part of either the parking lot and mainly the detention area on the west side and then the conveyance over ground along Lynn Lane. So the applicant is requesting relief from the stormwater requirements in section 16.9 of the UDC for this phase of the project. Um, this request, uh, and, and that, the purpose of that is to preserve those trees for now. Um, the request was notified in accordance with the UDC. Five property owners are notified directly by mail. The legal ad was published by October 6, 2022, and a sign posted on the property in a conspicuous location. And as of this date, we have received no response to the notification. And here is sections uh, 3.71 and 3.76, which are the criteria for variance and the criteria relating to stormwater for variance. At the November, or, sorry, October 26th Board of Adjustment Appeals meeting, uh, the board unanimously re uh, voted to recommend approval of the request with one condition. That condition is shown at the bottom and also in the staff report, is that any future expansion of the parking lot or building will require stormwater mitigation at that time. If there are any questions. Okay. Any questions to have them before I open it as a public hearing? Yes, yes. Alderman Carver. I was just saying, that's what my question was going to be. You said basically with emphasis as this pertains to this project or this portion of the project. Do you all foresee coming back on stormwater mitigation for a future project? It, yeah, if you expand the building uh, at a future date, then that would just trigger the stormwater requirements again, depending on what those requirements were at that time. 
Oliver Rook, did I see your hand? Amen. Oliver Brooks. Uh, oh, somebody. Yeah, it, it, okay. Sometimes the deed was triggered, uh, triggered this. But it was just an empty metal building, and so just the amount of renovations going into it were, were, were called for the triggers for the non conforming. Correct, correct. It, correct. it, it wasn't a square foot of duplex. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're leaving the vegetation, correct? Correct, and it's it's rather large trees that are also. So doesn't that, do, doesn't, doesn't that do in of itself do stormwater mitigation? Yeah, I'm not the expert, but uh, their engineer could speak on what the actual numbers of that are. It's uh, the way it's flowing off there now. From what I understand, it's pretty minimal. Um, so by actually clearing it, we're just creating it to flow faster into a detention uh, area, then release it off the I figured that's so. what would happen. So yeah. if I was treasure that, that, that's actually doing it. Correct. Doing? This is definitely an outlier project. Now, has this project had any other exceptions or variances done? The only other it? thing it had was a special exception to allow for the uh, restaurant cafe portion to this because it is located in an industrial district. Just the usage of it. Yeah, just so the use, uh, special exception, exception for, for the use, correct. Thank you. Um, anyone else before I... Uh, applicant is here. Do you have anything you'd wish to add to any of this? No. No? Okay. Uh, I want to say uh, Alderman made this kind of sustainability line. Um, so hey, come on up so the microphone can hear you. And identify yourself while you're here. Uh, Kenneth Thomas. I just like trees. So, you know, and, and like you asked, it, it does slow down, uh, you know, drainage. Well, we have all of town now. Yeah. The products where they strip the trees off. Pave, you know, pave everything, and then the water starts rolling. Right. We run into issues with that, and have already in South Park Stock. So this, uh, uh, I appreciate your, your keeping this vegetation natural. Okay. All right, thank you. So if there's nothing else, then I will open it as a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak either for or against this project, now would be the time in which to do so. Either for or against. Seeing none, I will close it as a public hearing. And if there are no further questions or uh, comments, then we need a motion. Move approval. I have, a mo well, I have an Alderman Carver with a motion for approval. Do I have a second? Second. A second from Alderman Sistro. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? This motion carries. Can, I ask, could, could I ask him a question Alderman, off the oh, subject? Sure. Is that okay to ask? Alderman. Maybe we'll become the coffee capital of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But did you just go, uh, I think I talked to you maybe to social media or something. Did, did you get some certifications in the coffee brewing? What was, what was that about? No, uh, I just technically got second place in U.S. coffee prelims in roasting. <coughs> so, um, so yeah, we're trying to be a leader in coffee in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. <laughs> so we get to be the coffee capital, too. Yeah. I think that's a new thing we're going to push for. So, yeah. Thank okay. you, sir. Looking forward to it. All right, thank you so much. Congratulations. We'll look forward to all of that. All right, next item up on the agenda is the public hearing consideration of a variance 22 14. Mr. Haviland. Yes, this is. Let me get the right slide. This is the request by Joe, Joe Kuvion on behalf of Tom Bosley for a variance from the request to deviate from setback requirements for an accessory structure at 23 or 230 Bancroft Avenue. That is located in the back of the new part, phase two of Adelaide subdivision. The applicant uh, has built an outdoor fireplace within the five-foot setback of the property. The fireplace was not uh, noted on the site plan during the permitting process as required. An outdoor fireplace is classified as an accessory structure of Unified Development Code. Um, therefore, it is required to be five feet off of the property line. Um, the, the applicant is requesting relief from Section 6.34 of the UDC to allow for the fireplace to remain. And so this image is just taken from the road in the alleyway showing the fireplace. The property line is pretty much the back side of the wall, um, just showing where it sits on the property. And this request was noticed uh, in accordance with UDC, 11 property owners of record were notified by mail. Uh, ad was published on October 6, 2022, and a sign placed on the property. As of this date, we received two phone calls just requesting information about the request and one email against the request, and that is shown in the uh, staff report. Here is the criteria for review and approve for this type of variance. At the October 26, 2022 Board of Judgment Appeals meeting, the board voted four to zero with one abstention to recommend approval of the request with one condition. The outdoor fireplace shall either be converted to gas only or a spark arrestor installed on top of the chimney. And so where that uh, condition, requested condition comes out of is just 
due to the location and in relation to the two grooves right there, there was some concern that there was wood burning in it, some sparks might fly down. So either part of that condition would solve that. Okay. Are there any right. questions? Thank you. Any questions of the board at this time? Over Is the applicant here? Well, I'm, I was going to ask him after I got questions from you guys. No, I guess I was just going to say they're okay with either the gas or the spark arrested. I believe they've had some discussions with the building official about adding a spark arrested to it because I believe the homeowner uh, prefers to keep it wood burning. Possible. All right, well, I'll tell you what, if, you want, if you'd like to come up, we'll have the applicant come up and, and speak. Is, is that, that just mean a flame retardant? What is what is spark arrested mean? I believe it's some sort of device on top to catch the sparks. Joe Kuby on here, y'all, sir. Yeah, it's, a, it's basically just a, a chimney cat with a with kind of a wire cage, and it just kind of just allows anything that does get through to the flue to kind of dissipate. And um, earlier in the week, or actually it was Monday, I met Steen, um, the building official, on site. We got up on a ladder, and we shot measurements. and. Um, according to seeing the, the way it's built currently meets code if it was going through your chimney of your own house. So um, we, we qualify without the spark arrestor, but we went ahead and got him to approve one uh, on Monday and just make sure he was okay with it. Uh, and he said he was. We bought, the, we bought it, we purchased it, and uh, we actually put it in place just, you know, just, just to go ahead and get it done, and we told him we were going to do it. Um, we told the client not to burn the fire in it or anything like that, and uh, pretty much pretty much that simple. Um, and, and originally, the, you know, the, the plan was approved as it was. Adelaide's kind of a close-knit neighborhood, which I'm sure you guys know. And it was on the plan, and I think it was just an oversight. I mean, it was drawn on there, so we just built it. Um, we didn't get the permit. Originally, the owner had hired somebody else, and then we came in after, after the fact and completed. Um, but here we are, just trying to figure out the resolution, too. Okay, let's see while we have you both, if there are any other questions. Oliver McCarver, did that answer your question? I guess I was going to ask. Steen, it's very interesting that you come from a back fire background. So Steen, would you come up, yeah. please? I was just going to ask you um, what an asset, I guess, it is for you to have the fire background at this time with this interesting case. But, I mean, is this anything you want to add to this that we need to be taking into our consideration? or is it No, just the fact that he, the spark arrestor is going to prevent the embers landing on the roof if leaves are built up or anything. And it just gives a chance for it to burn out quicker instead of just flying to there anyway. And you feel comfortable with everything? Yeah. Okay. I yield. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Basically, this is asking asking for forgiveness rather than permission. This time it is. Okay. <laughs> Glad you came. All right, thank you. Let me open it as a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak either for or against this particular item on the agenda? Either for or against. All right, seeing none, I will close it as a public hearing and entertain a motion. Move to approve. And that was Alderman Rupp. Okay, thank you. I have a motion from Alderman Rupp. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Alderman Carver. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consideration of curbside recycling. Alderman Beatty, this one is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just you know, don't have any st any information, any data or figures tonight on what could be proposed how it would be done and what it would cost. I just want to reiterate with the board. You heard Ms. Van Epps that came up earlier this evening. We're a progressive college town, an SEC college town. And we've got a recycling program. But I think it's time three years in for us to look at the, at the possibility of, a, of offering at least an opt-in, a buy-in type, a voluntary uh, type uh, curbside program to see but for people who would pay a fee for this service. And so what we're going to do and try to maybe come back at the next meeting with is some, in, some information about what the potential of that would, would, would cost on a per household basis to be able to do. Um, we think this is progression, or I think, I'll say I, that there are other people who are also other sustainable people and others that they think this would be as a progression for the city of Starville. Um, as we as we continue to improve our, our recycling efforts um, and uh, offer something for residents who are willing to pay that pay for that for that service. But uh, anyway, Mayor, I, at the next meeting I'll have a little more detail about that, and I would ask the, the board to be thinking about it, talking, you know, so other board members, constituents. I mean, I, I can't believe Stark, Mississippi, does not that whatever a demand or uh, for curbside recycling if there is an Oxford, Mississippi, or Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or all in Alabama. We have the same kind, you know, it's a, it's a university town, same kind of 
folks, same kind of income, you know, all, a lot of the same kind of stuff that these other places have, and they have curbside recycling. A lot of them have, most of them have mandatory. They charge the fee. And you either use the curb, you either, you know, you use it or lose it. You use the curbside uh, recycling availability uh, that the city's providing, and you know, it's part of your bill anyway. So, uh, but I, I would encourage all, all of my fellow board members to, to talk to people, see if, what kind of interest there is that is out there for it. We had curbside recycling at one time where people put their recycling single stream in a, in a plastic clear uh, green, but you can see through it, uh, see through bag. Uh, this probably would be something different where we wouldn't, would, not, would not use bags that collection people, the uh, waste pros and waste management people like that don't want bags to have to deal with. But something that will give our, even if it's once a month or twice a month, um, something that gives our citizens, our residents, an opportunity to have to pay for and have curbside recycling um, in the city stall. I think that's just a, a, a logical, logical progression for a city that's moving and doing a lot of first class things and, and moving forward as one of you know, Mississippi's top cities and, and, and certainly uh, one of the top uh, cities in the southeast United States. I yield. Thank you, Norman Bay. Mr. I know you're delighted to <laughs> have me extend this conversation, and I'd, I'd like to say that I am not opposed to the idea of, of curbside recycling. I do think it needs to be done in a financially responsible way. Um, currently, the sanitation fees that we're paying is subsidizing the free recycling program that we have right now. So one of the things that we would need to look at with this opt-in program is do we continue that free free program or not, or do we um, relieve the sanitation department of that responsibility and, and managing that under revenue streams that were not meant to manage that. Um, another is that there are two models that, that essentially work for this sort of thing. One is to have everybody um, contribute to it, and, and that keeps your fee down a bit. The other is to have an opt-in program, and your fees are going to be higher with that opt-in program. Um, I, I think that it, it would be critical as we're looking at this to um, make sure that there is the interest that Alderman Beatty's mentioned and that there is the density of services um, in a particular area to, to make it make sense to do curbside recycling. It doesn't make a lot of sense in my neighborhood if there are two people participating. It, it's a, not cost effective to do curbside pickup in my neighborhood. Um, so, so that's one of the things that needs to, to be looked at. I would suggest that as we're doing this, unless we're in a, an enormous hurry to get this done, I would suggest that we do this as part of a larger comprehensive look at our cost for operating the sanitation department. That's something that we've been talking about doing for a while anyway, um, and it would, it would make sense to do these things together. Another, another opportunity would be to do um, a request for proposals. Um, it, this doesn't have to be something that the city itself does. Um, we, we might enter into a contract with somebody else to provide that service. So um, I, I would encourage Alderman Beatty, as y'all are looking at options, to, to consider that idea of getting requests for proposals and see if there are commercial entities out there that are interested in partnering with us to, to provide this. They could, that would take the burden of guessing what the cost is going to be off of our people and your people um, to, and, and pushing it to the, to the commercial entity. But um, again, certainly worth looking at. Um, and, and I do think it would be um, a great time to take a step back and look at our sanitation services, top to bottom, what it costs us to provide um, what our opportunity costs are going to be if we give up um, what we will give up in order to be able to have the time to, to do um, curbside recycling. So just part of a larger, larger process. May, may I respond? Yeah. Um, I think it's, I know that we subsidize, um, Sister, I'm talking about us subsidizing recycling, um, the, the garbage, everybody's doing it. Everybody's, well, I say that. Uh, so Oxford 
charging five dollars a month, they generate three hundred thousand dollars in the recycling program annually because of that five dollar fee to the customer. So I mean, but I don't know whether they'll fly here or not. I just think that we are sharp enough place that we need to find a way to do this and not look for ways not to do it. And that's what we do right now. Or we have done in the last, you know, when I came on board, it was looking for a way not to do this. Um, I went to, down to Clinton, Mississippi last weekend, saw Mississippi College and Dell State play football. And when I got back, I picked up a copy of Clinton Curry newspaper, got back and went on Clinton's website. Just to, I'm just curious to see what, how they do their recycling. Now, they have commercial garbage pickup. Waste management picks up Clinton's garbage twice a week like we have. They have two, two time per week garbage, and they pick up recycling one on, on Wednesdays, one day a week, every week. Um, I don't know what their fee structure is, but I bet it's comparable to our fee structure. Um, I am certain that their garbage fee is, is subsidizing that recycling, but it's something they, they, they put enough value on it to think it's worthwhile for them to do. First of all, because it's the right thing to do, and second of all, because it's, it's, it's you know, uh, their citizens want it. Now, that's a college town with a lot smaller college, but, the, but they, they're doing a good job with it down there. Um, they also have, they have curbside recycling and they have the recycling collection sites. They have two of them in the front. Not just one like this, they got two. Oxford has curbside recycling and they have two collection sites. So you can choose, you can get it, pick it up, have them pick it up curbside on the designated day in the city of Oxford or in Clinton, Mississippi, or you can, you can carry the collection site either one. And they have two sites, not one. So those places that are very comfortable in size, and capability to start in Mississippi are both doing it. Finding a way to do it and not necessarily looking for a way not to do it. So that's what I want us to do with the board and the city is look for a way to do curbside recycling. And, and, and let's, let's find something that will work for us, that's financially, financially feasible for us, for us, and let's move forward to do it. Thank you. All right, and you'll be bringing that back next time. I need some help. I'd like some help with this. May, may I say one more thing before? Oh, before, before. Um, I, I would like to say that I, I, I don't view the idea of looking at this to be sure that it's financially sustainable as being um, opposed to doing it. And I, I think that, that sometimes when we bring up the idea of making sure that we're operating in a financially sustainable business, that it's, it's perceived as pushing back and being unwilling to provide a service. The city of Oxford has um, has a very robust recycling program. Um, I, I don't know if they charge the fee that you mentioned, uh, Alderman Beatty. I do know that for years they have subsidized that recycling program through their general fund, and that, that currently they subsidize that to the tune of about half a million to six hundred thousand dollars. So a, about two mills, for in our world. Um, would 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 go toward towards supporting a recycling program, um, and and those are the kind of things we need to to step back, and be sure that as we do this, we do this um, in a way that we can maintain it going forward, and and that we we are sure of what our cost and and all of that are as we get into trying to provide a service, and that there is a demand. For the service in the community. Um, thank you. We have an Oxford resident in the, in the building. Um, Councilor, what does, do you know what the fee, fee I do. I, I, I talked to the mayor today. I didn't know what it's, she asked me. It's, 20, it's twenty-two dollars. They went up from twenty-one this year to twenty-two. Um, they do not charge for recycling. They have the only cost for recycling is to buy the bin. They can have one or two bins. One bin is ten fifty, and two bins is twenty one dollars. I'm, sure, I'm sure. I'm certain they have they have some of that cost of recycling built into that. Oh, I'm sure they do. They subsidize it to the tune of five hundred and six hundred thousand um, dollars. They also have a recycling facility that Lafayette County and City of Oxford have built that, that, that they carry their stuff to that, that sorts it, and then they compact it and they sell it. On the, on the market, or cans, or aluminum no, cans. No, they have someone who comes and picks it up. Well, but they sell it, and they, they derive some income. I guess it runs that facility from that. But um, I, I guess let's just find a, see if we can find a, a way to have a curbside recycling program and, and find a way that's palatable for our citizens through a, a fee that we charge to our citizens. Uh, originally, Mississippi, 
um, charge, they do charge, it's a four or five dollar a month fee. They issue a bin, they put a barcode on it, it's a use or lose thing, it's not an opt-in. They come by and they pick up your recycling once a week and they dump it. When they do that, it, uh, what I, I asked the public works director two or three years ago down there when I met with him, how do you get, they said they had 97, 98 percent participation in their recycling curbside program. I said, how, and they have collection sites also. He said, how do, I said, how do you do that? He said, we charge a mandatory fee. They want to get their money's worth. Uh, the other thing is when they dump the, dump the, the roll-off can, the, the, the truck comes by and dumps it uh, once a week, they get it barcodes and it tells what household, it's got a code on it, uh, tells what household that came from, and uh, they get they get Risland bucks or points or something like that that they build up in their account and they can redeem that against their utility bill or they can take the money and go down to Pizza Hut and buy a pizza or something with it. Okay. Not, they, I'm, so Alderman Carver was, had something he wanted to add too, if that's all right with no, you. No, no, I mean, I just think, I, think that, I mean, that's a novel thing, but it, it works well for, for Britain. Yeah, I just think, I think from a sustainability threshold standpoint, I know uh, we may uh, think that recycling's great. There's a lot of people that don't, you know, agree on a mandatory fee structure. So I would say just from the discussion over the, uh, the last few years in Starkville. Um, but I think, I mean, if you would say you want help, I don't mind helping you. I think the best way to do is to, you know, obviously find the, uh, the cities that it works in and, and how that fee structure works there, if it's an opt-in or if it's a mandatory. But I hear a lot from both sides, and, and some of those, there are a lot of people that don't want a mandatory type fee structure. So like I said, if you want to, anytime you mention Clinton or Death State or anything, I don't mind calling down there. I would find out where it works in the southeast and, and how does it work there because here, you know, the, the threshold for sustainability is, is pretty tough to reach at times on an opt-in program, so that's my opinion. Um, yeah. their, you know, their waste management custom, and it, it may be the fact that waste management may say, you know, to get the garbage business thing, that may be something that's kind of caveat. It's okay if you get a garbage business, you get, you know, we want you to find some recycling. I mean, maybe something like that. But I just think that we, if we get in here real sleeve, we find some way to have a, a curbside recycling program that's not prohibitively expensive and something that, that, that we can offer our citizens as an option to. If you live on the south side of town where Jeffrey lives, instead of having, you know, uh, drive up to the north side of town to, to a collection site. If you want to do that, fine. But if you want to pay six or eight, oh, I don't know what it would be, but pay a, pay a fee to have a truck come by once a month or once every other week, something like that, and pick it up. Um, us find a way maybe to be able to do something like that. Sounds like the two of y'all make a great committee. Y'all get together and see what we come up with. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a claim stocket to go, and beyond that, we will be done. So, a motion for a claim stocket. A motion from Alderman Sistro for a claim stocket. Um, second from Alderman Carter. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, motion carries five to two. We are now at the point of nothing further on our agenda. So there will not be a work session because Veterans Day is the 11th, and that is the Friday, so we will not be having a work session. So um, if you would please, I need a motion to uh, recess. I have a motion from Alderman Vaughn to recess. Do I have a second? Sorry. Second from Alderman Brooks. Alderman, Alderman Bailey. Thank, thank you. All right. All those in favor, please signify, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We are in recess. Thank you, everyone.